Okay, so today we're going to be looking at Alexander the Great, and here he is right in the center of our image here. This is an old bust of Alexander. Now, Alexander, um, he's called the Great because he did some great things. Um, maybe not the nicest of people. Let's just get that out there. Um, he's someone who does great things through conquest. He is a leader of um, the Macedonians or the Macedonians, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, I, have, I have been told that today the country of Macedonia or North Macedonia is pronounced Macedonia, but ancient Macedonia should be spelt, uh, pronounced with a hard K, Macedonia, but I don't know. Hmm. You decide. Um, now, Macedonia is just north of where Greece is today. And uh, back in the times of ancient Greece, as we know from our lessons on Sparta and on Athens, um, that whole region of the world uh, are joined together through a common language, religions and beliefs and things like that, um, and culture. But they're all ruled over by different kings. You know, each different city has its own leadership or rulers or whatever. Um, but uh, so Alexander is going to be the king, the leader of Macedonia, this one particular kingdom, which is going to turn out to be quite a powerful kingdom, it must be said. Um, now, like all great people, he doesn't just magically become great. Um, he needs to have a really good background first. So we're going to start off today, before talking about what he does that is particularly grand or great, we're going to have a think about uh, where he might have got his greatness from. So we need to think about him a little bit as a child. Um, now, to be fair, Alexander only lives to 32 years old. So, you know, his childhood is quite important because it's like half his life, yeah? Or more than half his life. Um, but let's have a look at his parents. All great people need great parents, don't they, to get them going in the right direction? And Alexander is certainly no exception to that. Um, here we have this guy here is Philip II. He is king of Macedonia. Um, now, he is... Uh, TJ asks, do I have a drawing of him as a picture? I mean, behind me, he's on his horse here. Uh, but yes, you, you'll see lots of different uh, artistic styles uh, throughout this lesson. Uh, lots of different representations of Alexander. So yeah, you'll see some drawings as well. Um, I thought though we'd start with the busts because they show us, you know, they show us the relationship between father and son quite nicely here. Mm -hmm. Proper ancient sources. Um, oh, Rekid points out that Philip's nose has been cut off. Um, it's not that his nose has been cut off, and no, Napoleon did not shoot it off, Jasper. Um, ancient statues, they often have lost noses, because if you think about it, the nose is always going to be the first bit. If you break a, a head like this, or if you knock something against it, the bit that's going to come off is the nose. So a lot of ancient statues are missing noses. That's really common. In fact, I went to a museum in Copenhagen um, in Denmark uh, not long ago, and they had a huge collection of ancient Greek and Roman statues, loads of them missing noses. And in another part of the museum, they had a wall where they had just put all the noses. So you had a, a wall just full of you know, plaster and, and marble noses just stuck on the walls that they couldn't work out which statues they went with yeah so um, uh, sometimes they do try and replace noses Eliza yeah sometimes if they can find the right match um, they can do it but then you've got the question of is it right to tamper with ancient things you know should we be putting super glue or plaster or whatever we're going to put on there um, but no I mean it's very very common we you kind of if you're studying ancient art you've kind of got to get used to statues without noses it's it's more common than to have a nose to be honest um, there you go um, another sort of uh, artistic style you can see from these from these ancient busts as well they never did give the eyes any detail the eyes are always just round holes in the head um, they never do the pupils or anything which makes sometimes makes people these people look a little bit creepier than they should I guess the rest of them are usually quite accurate as you can see quite detailed but the eyes never are hmm. um, but anywho Philip is king of Macedonia and he's a pretty impressive king um, we're not you know this lesson is not about Philip II, the Great. Um, it's about Alexander, but let's just give you a bit of an idea about Philip. He has managed to 
make Macedonia into quite a formidable fighting force. He has built up the army through his reign. He has conquered neighbours. He has brought in uh, alliances from other cities and kingdoms um, together uh, to create a really strong country. Um, it's been described that Alexander is so great because he starts off with everything. Yeah, it's like um, I've I've had it described to me that you know Philip the Second he builds an amazing sports car and he puts the keys in the ignition and he starts it up so the engine's rumbling and then Alexander all he has to do is get into the car and drive it off. You know he doesn't have to do any of the hard work behind it, which maybe isn't quite fair on Alexander, but it is pretty accurate. Philip is a bit of a a bit of a genius and a bit of a legend. He has this army all ready to go. He's trained it, um, he's funded it, they've got all the weapons, the armor, the provisions they need. He's built forts on the edge of his kingdom, just ready, just waiting to go and invade uh, the world, um, uh, the world of the East. And then he dies. Poor old Philip, he dies. Now, uh, Neville Longbottom asks, did Alexander plot to kill his own father, or was it just a bodyguard that decided to kill him for no reason? <gasps> I wish I knew the answer. Ah. But let's go to the mother and, you know, we can come up with some ideas. Um, over here we have Olympias, um, his mum. Now, she is quite an amazing woman. Um, she's not Philip's only wife. You know, these are the times when uh, kings especially would have more than one wife. Um, but she's an important one of his wives. She is a truly, hmm, a truly amazing or truly terrifying woman, depending on how you want to look at it. I think it depends whether she's your friend or not, maybe. Um, she is supposed to be so wild and scary that even Philip is afraid of her. Now, Philip's not afraid of his other wives. He's afraid of Olympias. He, he's very scared of her because not only is she incredibly beautiful and incredibly strong um, and incredibly outspoken, she is also a little bit witchy. Just a little bit witchy. A little bit. Mm -hmm. She is a priestess of Dionysus, um, the god of wine and partying and uh, memory and things. So there you go. Uh, oh, sorry, Layla says that uh, they cannot see anything. Unfortunately, Layla, I don't know why. I think everyone else can see it. So you might need to fiddle with your own settings there, I'm afraid, uh, to try and make it so that you can see me. Maybe turn, uh, maybe come out of Zoom and come back in. That sometimes works. So yeah, maybe have a go at that. Um, yeah, she hangs around with weird mystical people. She is part of a mystical cult and she is obsessed, obsessed with snakes. Um, in fact, it's said that she walks around with snakes all the time, poisonous ones around her neck. She even goes to bed with snakes and they slither around on her pillow, which would give you some idea of why Philip was a bit frightened of her. She kind of, you know, she's a strong, powerful, ever so slightly witchy lady. Um, and she absolutely loves Alexander. Now, some people think um, that Philip is going to die because of her, but we have no proof of this. Um, what does happen is there's a great big party. It's like the hooray, I'm going to invade Asia party. Yeah, Philip, like I said, he's got everything ready. He's got the forts, he's got the army, he's got, the met, he's got it all sorted. Yeah, he's all ready to go. All he has to do is like go to the front and go, oi, that way, east, and the army will go off and they will conquer the world. But whilst he's celebrating, you know, the start of his campaign, just before he launches the army, um, he's got this great big party, he's giving a speech on stage, and up runs one of the, this guy who has, to be fair, this guy has uh, some serious issues with Philip for some very good reasons, which I'm not going to go into here because they're a bit mature. But um, he's very angry with Philip, and he comes up and he stabs him in the heart, and Philip drops down dead, as you would do if you were stabbed. Um, now, we don't know for sure why this guy did it. It might be just because he hated Philip. And to be honest, he had good reason, like I say. Um, Philip was not kind to him. Um, but it could be that Olympias wanted to get Philip out of the way so she could get Alexander to go and get all the glory. That's been speculated. There's no evidence. Um, it is strange that the bodyguards didn't stop this guy. So there are thoughts that maybe the bodyguards of Philip were paid, possibly by Olympias, um, to ignore this guy with the knife. Perhaps, 
yeah um some people even go so far as to say well maybe alexander himself had something to do with it the young man that he was although there's less evidence for that and the problem with this is is that this is so long ago and the evidence is so sketchy and patchy that we just don't know what happened or why it happened we know that he died um but we don't know why um uh, oh, Roxana, Alexander's wife, yes, um, is asking, why is Olympias in gold? Um, just because I couldn't find a bust of her. So I thought this was this was as close to the bust as I could get, to be honest. Um, and no, she's not a god, Mario Kart. Um, she is a queen. Yeah, she's um, a queen of a, a, a well, she, she's a princess from another kingdom uh, further to the north who has been sent to uh, marry Philip and to make sure that you know the two kingdoms have a strong relationship but she's also very very frightening um, um, it, you know uh, probably not to alexander alexander you know she was lovely to alexander but she was this you know one of these people that you, you would not want to cross if you get on her bad side you may literally wake up with a snake in your bed and it might bite you and that's the end of you so yeah she's a scary lady hmm. but with philip dead on the floor um that means that Alexander is now in charge of Macedonia and he's also in charge of a massive army that is completely ready to go invading. Yeah, I mean, it's, br it's brilliant for him. Um, it's not quite that simple. It won't be quite that simple, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, because let's go back in time a little bit and have a look at what Alexander was like when he was a child, when his mum and dad were still alive and everything was good. Um, and this tells us just how much Philip and Olympias adored their son. Um, oh, Eliza asks, how many children does Alexander have? That's a really good question and almost impossible to answer. Um, the answer is probably quite a few children, um, but how many of them are actually legitimate? There was only a few. Um, so yes, there you go. Um, so yes, Philip is stabbed to death. Uh, but before all this happens, Alexander has to grow up and he is treated really well by his parents. I mean, for a start, he has the best teacher, arguably, that anyone could ever have. Um, there's a guy hanging around at this time called Aristotle. Now, Aristotle is one of the famous, one of the most famous philosophers in history. He's a Greek philosopher. He is the pupil of Plato, who was the pupil of Socrates. So we're talking, you know, some of the most intelligent guys in the world. And um, he is taken from Athens to Macedonia to be Alexander's private tutor. Now, in this picture, we can see the philosopher Aristotle teaching um, Alexander. Alexander looks a bit bored, to be honest, um, <laughs> which is maybe a bit unfair because Alexander is said to have uh, have kept a copy of um, uh, a written copy of Homer's. Uh, Iliad under his pillow uh, or carried it with him for most of his life to sort of remind himself of her heroism and how to be a good leader and all this kind of stuff. Um, but he was also, uh, Alexander wouldn't have actually been sat there on his own one-to-one. -one. It would have been Alexander and a group of friends, you know, princes uh, from other kingdoms, uh, rich people. Um, there would probably be a handful of them, maybe 10 to 12 people, uh, young boys, all learning from Aristotle in this really intense way. Aristotle would teach them every day about everything he knew. So Alexander is not growing up a dummy, yeah? He's, he's a clever guy and he's got the best teacher that you can get. So that's a pretty good start. Um, oh, the question is, why does he have a green hand? I think it's just because this piece of artwork's quite old, that's all. Yes, I don't think it's supposed to be green. <laughs> um, now, uh, <laughs> um, he also, like all young men, he needs to have a best friend, yeah? And Alexander's best friend will be his, his horse. Uh, how do I say it? Bucephalus, I think. Bucephalus, something like that. Um, Busaf uh, Bucephalus? could be hmm. i did look it up but now i've forgotten again that's what happens with pronunciations um so oh the civilization uh joshua is macedonia yeah so we're talking northern greece um yeah now when uh alexander is a young boy a horse trader comes to macedonia um and has with him this a most amazing horse i mean i say amazing it is amazing. It looks beautiful. It's big. It's strong. Um, 
and it's absolutely wild. I mean, completely wild. Now the trader brings it to Philip the king and says, look, do you want this amazing horse? Um, it's pretty expensive, but you, you know, you're a king, you can afford it. The king says, Philip says, nah, I don't want your horse. It's too wild. No one's going to be able to tame that thing. Uh, no, I'm not going to pay you for it. Now, Alexander is watching this and he's fallen in love with this horse just by seeing it. And so he goes to his dad, Philip, and he says, all right, look, I'll try and tame the horse. Let me try. If I fail, I will pay for it myself. I mean, he's a prince. He's got money after all. Um, but if I succeed, you can pay for it and give it to me as a present. So his dad says, fine, I mean, whatever, have a go. And so this is where Alexander starts to show his intelligence. He walks up to the horse, this wild bucking horse, which won't let anyone touch it. And he starts to very calmly stroke it and whisper things into its ear. Now, he then gets the horse turned around so that it's facing directly into the sun so it can't see properly because Alexander has worked out that it's afraid of its own shadow. That's what's making it so wild. It keeps seeing its own shadow on the floor and jumping and skipping and you know, bucking and rearing. So he makes it face the sun so that it can no longer see its own shadow. Um, and uh, how old is he at this time? That's a good question. Um, we're talking teenager, yeah, a young man. Uh, I don't know if, if his exact age, I mean, exact ages are always hard to figure out here, especially with the young life. Um, he then realizes that his own cloak is billowing in the wind and that's scaring the horse so he takes his cloak off all the while being really calm and within a few minutes the horse is completely tame <gasps> alexander has made his best friend forever um this horse and him will campaign together across the known world man and horse best of friends yay that's it and of course philip paid for the horse and philip says wow okay this this kid just isn't a normal kid this is someone special. So we know from a young age, he was pretty impressive. You know, he's got the best teacher. He's, you know, intelligent enough uh, to tame a horse, you know, do the thing that no one else thought they could do. Uh, he's also quite brave. I imagine that lots of teenage boys would not want to go near this, um, this huge bucking horse, uh, this wild creature, but he does. Um, uh, Bucephalus, is, I think is how you say the horse's name. Uh, you spell it like down here, I don't know. Uh, B-U-C-E-P-H-A-L-U-S. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, so, Philip dies. And Alexander, he wants to take that army that Philip has built up. Um, and he wants to conquer the world with it. But before you conquer the world, you really do need to secure your place at home. So uh, we're going to have a look today at the four main stages of the campaigns of Alexander. Now, if we properly wanted to go through and study Alexander the Great and understand what he did at each of these points and each of these battles, you know, we could do this for the next year. Um, you know, just just going through battle to battle to to um, Bucef Bucephalus. Ah, that's that's good, Fleur. I like that. Yeah, Bucephalus. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to spend a year going through all the different details. Um, let's, let's just say that Alexander is great for a reason. It's because he achieves a lot in a very short period of time. But we are going to look at, at four of the main sort of areas of, of what he did here. Um, and we're going to start at home. Um, this map here shows the first part of his invasion of the East. And here we've got some dates. So 334 uh, BC, this is when he's setting out on his, that's when he becomes king and he's setting out. But uh, even this map doesn't go into as much detail as we really need because becoming king isn't just, you know, an instant thing. It's not like my dad's dead, I can become the king. No, other kingdoms, other people, other princes, they want to take over. And so Alexander's first job is to do a little bit of a Greek tour. He heads down um, to Thebes and the people of Thebes refuse to, refuse to submit to him, so he burns Thebes down. Um, Athens, the people there, they refuse to um, take him as their king but then they look at the burning walls of, that, of Thebes and they decide, well, actually, uh, yeah, you can be king. No, <clears throat> that's fine. So he takes Greece. Um, he then goes and he heads across his Macedonia up here. He then heads east into what is now Turkey. 
and it's there that he starts beating tribe after tribe after tribe and that's where he's picking up you know i said that his dad had an army ready to go this is where he picks up that army and he really starts to head forwards and we'll look at the army in, in a bit actually but not quite yet now yes here we have uh, something that he does over in a place called gordia um now this is a, a, a famous painting of our man Alexander uh, in this place with the old wise men around him. Um, and the idea is that in this town, it wasn't like a massively important town, but uh, it's a cool, cool little kingdom, let's call it. Um, the people there, they had a legend. There was a chariot with a really big knot. Uh, you can just about see the knot here, this great big, you know, it's not just like a knot that you'd get in your shoelaces. This is a big knot. It's like just this crazy, confusing mess of, of string. Just this ginormous knot on this chariot, which kind of sits out in the town square. And there's a legend, um, a bit like the legend of King Arthur, actually. Um, whoever can untie the knot will be king of the city. Yeah. And of course, lots of people have tried to untie the knot, but it really was a very, very big knot. So there we go. Um, uh, Galaxy Midas, I think you might have accidentally lent on a button there. Um, uh, now, yes, so, so the legend is that he's supposed to, that the person who unties the knot is going to be king. Now, Alexander is not like normal people, yeah? He walks up to the knot, all the people are gathered round, he picks up his sword or, or an axe, depending on which version you're looking at, and he just chops the knot to bits. Yeah, and says, look, ta-da, I undid the knot. I'm now king, do what I say. And everyone's like, whoa, okay, well, you kind of, technically, you undid the knot, I suppose. I mean, the knot is definitely undone, and you do happen to have an army and a big axe. So, okay, yeah, you can be king. And he takes over the Gordia as well. So this shows Alexander's, uh, I mean, in a, if we're going to be generous, it shows that Alexander can think outside of the box. Yeah. Um, he just, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he tries to, you know, do things that maybe other people wouldn't see. Uh, Layla is sighing. Oh, oh, is that cheating? I don't know. You decide. Is that cheating or is that just being super clever? Um, either way, um, Alexander manages to, you know, uh, sort of fulfill the prophecy. It's like if, like, it's like if King Arthur had uh, gone up to the sword in the stone with a pickaxe and just sort of smashed up the stone and just taken the sword from it. You know, would he still be king? I don't know. I'm not sure how the prophecy works. <laughs> um, <hang on. laughs> no. All right. So he sweeps through what is now Turkey quite handily. Um, and next, he sets his sights on Egypt. Mm. Now, no disrespect to uh, the people living in uh, in Turkey back then. I mean, they had they had good little cities and things. I mean, most of it is owned by the uh, Persians at this point. To be fair, and we will come back to Persia in a minute. Um, but Alexander. We could say probably that his main goal, at least to start with, was to take down Persia. But he's going to get distracted and he's going to head down to Egypt because Egypt is really important. Egypt is a massive civilization, as we know. Uh, this is a long, long time after the Great Pyramids built. This is even a long, long time after Tutankhamun. I mean, you know, those things are ancient by this point, just to give you some context. But um, Egypt is really important for the world. It's a great superpower. It has really powerful armies. It has powerful cities. It also grows a lot of grain. Um, and if you can take Egypt, you've basically got almost a never ending kitchen. You know, just it's just going to keep producing more and more and more and more food, which is what you need, especially if you've got an army and you're planning to take it across the world. Mm. Um, uh, now, um, he comes down to Egypt and it's not easy. Um, we can see that there's all these places that he stops off at and takes over, you know, like I say, we could talk about this for a very, very long time if we we're going to go into detail. Um, but the next sort of important place maybe is Gaza. Now Gaza, back then part of Egypt, um, is the first really heavily defended place that he comes to. And 
it's not easy to take Gaza, but Alexander does it anyway. I mean, you'll see this the, the, this this repeat itself through our story today. Um, things aren't easy for normal people. For Alexander, most things seem to be pretty easy. To be fair. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry, fingers now. It says AC because these are foreign maps. Um, I like the look of the maps, so they're useful to see. But yes, it, just think BC, basically. Yeah, uh, it's because they they are I don't know Spanish or something. These maps. So the names are a bit different as well in places, as you'll know. Instead of Alexandria, it says Alejandria. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Uh, but for, for our purposes, being able to trace our lines down, they're pretty useful. Now, um, so Gaza puts up a fight. There's a, he has to take down a walled city to get in there. And during that battle, he is hurt in the shoulder. He gets a wound. But does it stop him? No, it doesn't. Um, he ends up stomping on Gaza after a few attempts and then pushing on through to Egypt, where he takes the whole thing. We can see he does like a little, a little warlord's tour of Egypt. Uh, he takes Memphis, which would have been the capital back then. He goes up. He... Now, another thing that, uh, that Alexander does, he doesn't just take cities and stomp on people. He also builds new cities where he goes. So um, there are lots of cities called Alexandria lots of them across the world um so many that it just gets ridiculous i mean we can see two on this map already already uh, alexandria alexandria um because he liked to name cities after himself and when you're building a lot of cities or taking a lot of cities over you know you're gonna run out of names eventually so you may as well just call them all you that tells us a little bit about him what a weirdo says Layla. um i don't know i mean alexander's a nice name maybe he just thought that that would be the the best way to name the cities um, so he does a little circuit of Egypt, taking everything over. And by the time he comes back to Memphis, Egypt is well and truly uh, beaten. Um, now, Alexander knows well enough that he can't just come into places and smash them apart and you know, expect them just to follow him. He needs to set up, um, he needs to have leaders there who are going to work on his side. He needs to make the people happy. And in Egypt, he does this through religion. Um, he starts being called Zeus Amon. Now, Amun or Amon is the Egyptian horned god. And this is a coin uh, that Alexander's people would have made around this time on the, on the capture of Egypt. And you'll notice that it looks like Alexander the Great as we know him, but with one quite important addition. Um, he got horns. Oh, yeah, Alexander's got horns. Because the god Amun, um, is the horned god. He is the god with horns, sometimes represented with like head of a sheep or whatever, or a ram, um, sometimes just a human with great big horns. Um, and so Alexander knows that if you want to really be accepted by a place, then surely you've got to, you've got to fit in with the religion. So he starts telling the people of Egypt, look, I am a combination of Zeus, my god, and Amun, your god. Um, I am, you know, the offspring of those two. I am the horned god himself. And so the people of Egypt, they, or a lot of them, not all of them, surely, um, they bow down and they're like, yes, you are, you are, you know, being sent by the gods uh, to take over this place and we will accept you as our leader. Um, which is good news because Alexander's got a lot more conquering to do. He's just getting warmed up at this point. <laughs> Ah, oh, Leila says you feel sorry for Alexander. What, because he's got horns? Um, <laughs> uh, no, not donkey ears, um, just uh, ram's horns, I suppose we could say. Yeah. <laughs> so Egypt is now part of Alexander's empire. His empire is growing. He's got Greece and Macedonia. He's got Turkey. And now he's come down south and he's got Egypt as well. Um, he's not going to stop there, though. He's got further to go. And I said his main aim, really, and the aim of his father was to take down Persia. Now, we did a lesson on Persia. We looked at the first four important Persian uh, emperors. Um, the most important probably being Cyrus the Great, and then uh, Darius the First, and then we had uh, uh, Xerxes the First. At this time in history, those guys are, are gone. You know, they're, they're all dead and gone. That's back in time. Um, by this point, there's uh, the leader of Persia, the king of Persia, the king of kings is Darius the Third. 
So we're talking a relative of the other kings that we've looked at, but further down the line, yeah. So Darius the third is in charge, and it's Darius the third who uh, Alexander is going to start fighting. But before we get to that properly, let's have a little look. At least one of the reasons, again, we could talk about this for a long time, at least one of the reasons why Alexander is able to do this. Why is he able just to stomp through Greece and Turkey and Egypt and just take it? Um, a lot of it comes down to these guys here. Now, Alexander's army is impressive. Alexander's army is varied. He has people on horses. He has people uh, with bows and arrows. He has, uh, you know, he has ships. He has baggage trains you know he's good at making use, use of things and he's really good at coming up with battle plans um but i think the real secret the one thing that really makes him stand out from others is something that was invented by his dad philip ii uh, and that's the sarissa um the sarissa is an incredibly long spear and you can see here just how long these spears are uh, here's the guy here's the end of the spear um uh, these things are humongous, really hard to carry around. You know, you're not running anywhere with one of these spears, to be honest. But if you get enough of these spears together in one great big block called a phalanx, which I think we looked at when we looked at Sparta or and Athens, they, they fought in phalanxes. Um, but the big difference is their phalanxes would have looked the same, round shields, you know, loads of men stood together, but their spears would have been short they would have come to about th this row here. You know, so our guys in the front would have had spears that came out a bit like that, maybe as much as this. Uh, Philip, what he does is he doubles, and in some cases almost triples, the length of these spears. And to be honest, if you were one man or one woman with a Sarissa, you'd be pretty rubbish in a fight. Yeah, you'd be kind of, you know, someone would run at you and you'd be like flailing at them with this great big long pole with a point on the end the chances of you hurting anything are quite slim they'd just run past you and probably punch you wouldn't they um but you get hundreds of men stood together with deep ranks standing as one immovable block with all these sarissas pointing outwards like a ginormous hedgehog or a porcupine and then you imagine somebody trying to run at this. Can you imagine if you if your job in a battle is to charge at these guys here and kill them, but you've got to get through this, this forest of insane spears, because the ones in the front here, these points here, are connected to the man in front. The points behind are the guys behind them. The points behind that are the guys behind them. And it keeps on going back and back. And we can see that it must go even further behind because there's even more spears here. Just you're not getting through that. Nobody's getting through that, especially since no one else has such long weapons. It's impossible, pretty much. So yes, it is a massive army hedgehog, Eleanor. Yes. Um, it would be like stabbing meatballs with a chopstick. Yeah, that's right, Eliza. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, Rowan asks, what is his mum's name? His mum's name was Olympias. Uh, a bit like Mount Olympus, I suppose. Uh, that's how I remember it. Olympias. Um, uh, finger sales snares just move the spears. The problem is these spears are a solid wall. If you, I mean, the way to defeat it is to get around the sides, of course, but that's easier said than done, um, especially if Alexander's in charge because he's a bit of a genius. It's not just that he has this technology; he knows how to use it, and it's not just that it's you know, it's not just these phalanxes. Um, it's supported by archers and men on horses and, you know, different groups of people with specialist jobs. So the phalanx is the core of his army. It's the thing that probably is most effective, but it's all the rest of it. And as we'll see as we go through, he will even adapt his army depending on the terrain he's fighting in and you know, where he's going. So let's have a look at what he does in Persia. Um, now, as he's leaving these places, um, He's, he's setting up what we call satraps, which is a word that we saw when we looked at the Persian Empire. And this is a word that Alexander would have understood and a concept he would have understood. Um, you don't just take down a place or, or burn it to the ground. Um, you take it over and then you instill, install one of your friends as the satrap, the leader of that area, who is responsible and has to report to you. But other than that, they're left to do their own thing. Um, Alexander's not really, for most of his career anyway, he's not interested in sitting around. He's not that kind of guy. Um, he's got an army. He's going to use it. Um, 
he's not going to sit around, you know, making laws and thinking about taxes and chatting with the priests. It's not his kind of thing. Yeah. Um, he's going to get satraps to do that. And so as he storms through uh, Persia, he's going to leave satraps where he goes. Now we can see on this map, and sorry, it's not a Spanish one, I know, but we can see other places called Alexandria. Here we are. Here's uh, Babylonia, Babylon. Uh, we've uh, looked at that city before, I think. Um, and he basically, Alexander, launches this campaign that is just going to chew through Persia. And the Persians, to give them credit, they keep trying to, um, to stop him, but they keep failing, um, unluckily, because uh, what they're doing is they're marching on. Uh, Alexander just keeps on marching on and on and on. Every now and again, Darius the Third. Um, let's move my move him this way. Here's Darius the Third, or or a representation of emperor of the High King, Darius the Third. Um, he keeps on getting armies together and then facing off um, against Alexander, and he keeps failing and having to run away. And so this part of the campaign is almost like some kind of cartoon chase. Yeah, Alexander will meet the armies of Darius. Darius's armies will flee, they'll run away, and Alexander will chase them a bit further. And well, eventually they will get to have another battle and Darius will run away. And it just keeps on going over and over and over and over. Until eventually, of course, Darius is captured and Darius is killed. Um, but this shows another character side to Alexander, I guess. Alexander respects a good enemy. Yeah, he doesn't, um, you know, after chasing Darius through Persia from battle to battle to battle, once Darius is dead, he gets a proper good funeral, you know, with, a, with all due respects given. Um, and that's maybe the hallmark of Alexander, too. Generally speaking, although I am going to point out a, a, a bit of a problem here in a second, but generally speaking, Alexander is kind and respectful to the people he conquers. Um, he's not, in, in all cases, in some cases, he is just completely brutal. But in most cases, he will take over a city and look after that place. Um, doesn't always happen. Uh, in Giza, when he d takes down Giza in Egypt, he kills all the young men and he sells all the women and children as slaves, you know. He's just like, I'm done with you lot. When he captures Thebes in Greece, he burns it to the ground and divides up the land amongst other kingdoms. You know, Thebes is gone. Uh, when he uh, comes to Persopolis, uh, which is the capital of the Persian Empire, um, raised up, of course, um, by Darius uh, I. Uh, oh, I'm bringing my writing with me. Can't really help it. Um, when he ends up in Persopolis to take over the Persian Empire, Persopolis is in Iran, he stays there for a few months. This is a time when he does sort of chill out a little bit. Um, he ends up getting married um, to Roxanne. I believe that's in Persopolis as well, although it might have been further north in Bactria. Um, and, you know, he spends a few months there, but one night, the whole place mysteriously gets burnt down. Um, now, this is hard to follow in history. We're not sure if it was burnt down intentionally. Um, some, some sources from the time say that Alexander burnt the place down because uh, Greece was attacked and Athens was burnt many years before by Xerxes I. We looked at that when we looked at the Persian thing. And maybe this was revenge on Xerxes, because this was Xerxes, you know, the fire started in Xerxes' personal palace, although Xerxes is long dead by this point, of course. So some people think Alexander started this fire on purpose just to get his revenge on the Persians. Um, other people think that maybe, you know, there was some kind of drunken accident. Maybe there's a big party and someone knocks over a candle and the whole place goes up. Um, other people think that maybe there are other powers at play, darker, more sinister shapes in the shadows, setting fires. Uh, Layla asks, how many wives does he have? I don't know how many ended up with. I, I didn't look at that. Um, more than one, I believe. I mean, his famous wife is Roxana. I don't know if he has more than that. He certainly had lots of girlfriends, um, you know, wherever he went. So, you know, and one of his good, you know, ways of bringing people together was to you know, have wives and girlfriends from other places. So, you know, let's have an Egyptian girlfriend to keep the Egyptians happy. Let's have Persian girlfriends, all this kind of thing. Um, so uh, we'll come to his death in a minute, Ibrahim. Um, 
at the moment he's still alive in Persopolis, but the place is burning. Um, as Persopolis burns, Alexander either has a change of heart, he feels sorry that it's burning, or he panics and he didn't, never wanted it to burn, but he tries to put the fire out, uh, but unfortunately it gets out away from him and most of the city is destroyed. And it seems that Alexander regrets this quite quite hugely because he's burnt down one of the great, you know, one of the amazing capitals of the ancient world. Um, so yeah, either he accidentally did it and regretted it or he did it on purpose and then regretted it. Either way, he wasn't happy about it, that's for sure. Um, so, he doesn't stop there though. He keeps on going and he decides, I'll take India. Why not? Now, at this point, no one had ever been to India. This is how, <laughs> well, I mean, obviously Indian people had, but people from Greece didn't regularly go to India. It wasn't really a thing. I mean, people knew it existed. It was on the map. And of course, the Persians knew about it because it bordered their country, uh, their empire. But taking India, no one does that. India is full of wild things. Yeah. I mean, literally wild animals. But back then, you would have considered them wild people too. People that were not Greek. Um, uh, and uh, so our next map, our final map for today, shows a whole load more cities called Alexandria. One, two, three, four, five. Um, Alexandria Escate is means Alexandria the furthest, I believe, um, the, the one that's furthest away from the capital. There's another one here and another one and another one and another one. You know, he's running out of ideas. Oh, there's two more down the bottom. Let's just call everywhere Alexander. Why not? You read line there, Eliza. I mean, why not? I mean, it's a good name. Like I say, it's a strong name. You may as well uh, call it <laughs> that. Um, oh, uh, uh, Roxana, thank you, has given me the name of three of Alexandra's wives. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. So we've got uh, Parastasis, uh, Satyria, and Roxana. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, there are 12 Alexandras. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, there's lots, lots, lots. Um, most of them aren't called Alexandra today. So a famous city called Kandahar, um, that's called Kandahar today. It's no longer called Alexandria. Uh, most of them have had their names changed over time. Yeah. But Alexander, he keeps going. He smashes through into Afghanistan. Uh, he goes all the way up to what is now Turkmenistan up here. Um, and then he starts to come down and he decides that he'll cross uh, the Indus and head into India, which is, uh, here's the Indus River here, which is kind of the traditional border between I don't know, Afghanistan and India back then, or what we would now call Afghanistan. It's all very different because the place names are different back then. Um, well, don't do that. Greeks don't do that. You know, no one's ever seen a phalanx fighting in India. I mean, this this gives us this amazing mix of this amazing clash of cultures. Um, we've got phalanxes fighting with Asian elephants. I mean, just what? <laughs> it's like you take two completely different cultures. It's like the Europeans invading South America. You know, you take black powder and you mix it with. Uh, Jaguar warriors of the Aztecs or something. You know, here we're taking Greek hoplites and we're putting them against uh, Indian elephants. Now, uh, Alexander down in India is going to find a new sort of super enemy, if you like, um, uh, called uh, Porus. I mean, his name is sometimes spelt in different ways, but we'll go with sometimes it's spelled Puru, but we'll go for Porus um, up here. Let me just spell it right. Um, now, Porus is one of uh, a king of India. I mean, India is a huge thing and it's not all owned by one person at this time. Um, and on his way into India, Alexander takes down quite a few different Indian kings and rulers. Um, Porus is one of these who tr proves to be the hardest. Um, there's a great big battle um, a bit south in the Indus Valley or around here somewhere where Porus's troops are vastly outnumber Alexander and Alexander takes a lot of time you know there are little battles leading up to the big one where it's touch and go Alexander's troops are finding it hard to just defeat this this might of this huge Indian army led by Porus and Porus is brave and he is strong but eventually through some daring maneuver um, there's a monsoon going on in India at this time and the river that they're fighting across gets swollen it gets completely uh, you know full of water impossible to cross you might have thought impossible for normal people 
not for Alexander. So uh, whilst Alexander sends his 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 hoplites, his phalanxes into the centre of the uh, Indian army, he sneakily manages to get cavalry and infantry across the swollen river somehow um, to smash into the Indians' flanks, where they thought they were protected by the swollen, you know, the the raging river. They thought no one could ever get to them, uh, but they were wrong, and Alexander takes it down um <laughs> captain toad says that they feel like this is a myth it's not a myth this is history um he is a bit mythological he is a bit mythological now whilst fighting against porus something very sad happens oh now we can see that there's a city here called alexandra busafela which is named after his beautiful horse because it's here in india that his horse dies his best horse friend and what, hap what do you do when your best horse friend dies? Well, you take over a city. Well, no, you build a city and you name it after your horse, especially if you've already got 14 cities named after yourself. Yeah. Um, now, on our elephant here, um, Alexander respects King Porus. Um, he defeats Porus, but Porus doesn't die. And Alexander says, you're pretty cool. I like you. Um, you can be a satrap. How about you be in charge of this part of India? In fact, I'll give you more land than you had before you were before you fought me. Um, you know, you're my man now, so you're gonna have to give me taxes and stuff. But you can look after India. And by the by, that elephant over there, that really big one, that's a really cool elephant. I'm gonna call it Ajax. And so Alexander names this elephant Ajax and gives it the markings of Zeus and makes it into this like holy warrior elephant because uh, he just likes animals. I think you know who doesn't. Um, now, Alexander then is going to head back down into India. He's going to go all the way south. He's going to smash the whole thing up. He's going to run through the rainforests. Oh, hang on. No, he's not. He'd like to. He's ready to. Um, but his army by this point, you know, there are hoplites there. Most of the hoplites there have been with him since Macedonia. They've just spent years crossing the world, killing everything they see and taking over cities and calling them Alexander. Um, they've had enough by this point um so some some stories tell us that they started to get spooked out i mean there's a wonderful story of how uh, these greek soldiers you know they're far far away from home they're starting to hit almost like rainforest territory which is not something where greeks are, are familiar with and they're looking up into the trees and there's little people up there throwing fruit at them and it freaks them out you know these aren't little people of course these are monkeys but monkeys unlike they've ever seen before. I mean, they've never been to India. Um, and so they're getting spooked and they're ready to go back to their wives and their parents and their families and all this kind of stuff. And they basically put their foot down and they say to Alexander, we're not going any further. There's no way, you know, we, we want to go home, Alexander. I mean, I'm sure we could take over the rest of the world, but can we stop now, please? And Alexander is, well, forced, I suppose, to listen to them. He has to because he knows that he can't go further without an army. And really, his army are on the point of just leaving him to it, I think, at this point. So he says, fine, we'll go home. But he doesn't go home the easy way. He decides that as he goes home, he'll do just a little bit more conquering. Oh, just a little bit more. Um, so we can see his, this is his path into India. Goes up here. On his way out of India, he comes around the south here, uh, conquering all these little tribes, uh, Indian tribes, as he goes. Um, he does make a bit of a mistake because he's heading back to Babylon and he decides to take the, the difficult route through a desert. And it's this desert which probably kills more of his men than battle ever has because um, a lot of them you know, drop down dead of dehydration as they go on through. But eventually most of the army gets home and they get back to Babylon where Alexander can finally chill out for a bit. Or I imagine in Alexander's mind, just get ready for another great big fight somewhere else, yeah? build up his army, go back to India, finish off the job. He's only 32 years old. Now, the letters that we have going back and forwards from him and his mum in particular, they start giving us some worrying ideas about Alexander. Because Alexander, at the start, he seems to be quite a level-headed, intelligent guy. And he doesn't lose that intelligence. But just to put yourself in his place for a minute, he's been through, he's been made a god in Egypt. Um, he's taken over the most powerful empire of all time, the Persians, and they worship him, worshiping him like a god. Um, his mother keeps writing him letters saying that he is the son of Zeus. He is a literal demigod. The people of India bow down to him. By the time he's on his way back to Babylon, he really does start to believe he's God, and he starts to act a little bit arrogant. Yeah, he's not. He's maybe not as nice as he used to be. 
he's he's ordering people around he's he's giving them weird orders some historians think that he's literally going mad at this point the power has just got to his head maybe or maybe he has some underlying medical issue that we just don't know about um but no it's not good um he starts getting more erratic he starts getting more strange um but you know we don't know how that would have ended maybe a bit of time in babylon would have calmed him right back down again you know maybe just a, a hug from his mum if he'd ever got back to greece but he doesn't because they're in babylon something goes wrong people have said poisoning people have said illness we don't know but after about 11 days of illness alexander drops down dead um 32 years old conqueror of the known world and a little bit of the unknown world too um and he just dies you know he's never killed in battle it's kind of a a sad way to fizzle out for a hero like this you know a demigod he just drops down dead you know, gets ill dies like the best of us would i suppose i mean you can't really defeat disease can you um uh hi goodbye asks if alexander had loved longer do you think he would have taken over the world maybe yeah maybe he would have just kept going you know i'll have china i'll, I'll have the lot whatever uh, maybe he'd have found his way somehow uh, over to america and just just add it all who knows um but yeah 32 year old he's dead and sadly um his great achievement oh here's a picture of his funeral in the city of babylon or a representation of his funeral here's his his coffin was supposed to be this great huge thing on wheels with pillars with the coffin in the middle uh, and the people were said to have wept for days um but really the people are going to weep for a long time because what happens when the king of the world dies the world goes slightly mad um alexander had set up a lot of satraps and he, he was too young to have an heir i mean he did have a son but his son was supposed to be a bit disturbed um i mean the sources say that he didn't really have a brain um you know whether that's just being offensive or whether that's a, an actual comment on his intelligence i don't know um but when he dies his son is still a baby so that doesn't really help us anyway so his empire this is this is his empire to his full extent if we put those four maps we've looked at together you know he starts off in greece he takes turkey he takes egypt he takes persia and then he takes all of this here down into india it's incredible really um but the whole thing falls apart different satraps take different parts of his empire they fight there are wars that go on for years across his empire to try and decide who should be the next alexander and the answer is there never is another alexander because no one can ever put it together again um some of the more important guys i mean olympia uh, takes over greece for a time uh with help from a from a boyfriend um but even she doesn't last too long um uh persia gets ripped into shreds into different you know kingdoms again india just sort of goes back indian uh egypt is taken over by a guy called ptolemy one of um alexander's generals who will be the uh, ancestor of cleopatra the famous cleopatra um but yeah no one gets to be quite as great as alexander ever again um we'd have to look at i don't know the conquest i don't even i can't even think of of a modern person who's conquered quite so much maybe you know i don't know not even adolf hitler managed to capture so much land i mean no nah, it's a big big empire that alexander carved out for himself but he didn't keep it for long all right um thank you very much guys i will see you on friday where we're going to have a look at a similar king king arthur um maybe more a fictional though because it's mythology friday of course and uh, thank you very much for joining me today i hope everyone has a wonderful time uh, for the rest of the day enjoys the sunshine and yeah see you soon adios <laughs> bye